Um, okay, uh, welcome back. Let's uh, kick off the day. Um, hope everybody will join the Brett Betty and company. And, um, and enjoy the energy of uh, the day yesterday. I think what you saw was the really sort of the, the, the breath yesterday of everything from uh, you know, science and, and, and trials to what patients really bring to our community and is so central. Um, and, and then all the industry involvement that, that we are um, uh, seeking in order to really bring treatments to the bedside. What I thought to, I'd do today, and the, the focus is clearly different, is around uh, our Patient Learning Academy, and um, the notion here is to create a two-way street where we tell you, as from the point of view of physicians, what kinds of uh, trials, what kinds of progress uh, are happening in healthy and and then we hear from you what are your priorities, what's important to you, and what are we not thinking of um, that we should be um, undertaking. So really the Patient Learning Academy is about uh, this exchange, uh, this process of um, educating you how we as healthcare providers think about trials, about um, what we need to do in order to satisfy the regulatory authorities, but more importantly, um, how can, what you can tell us about uh, what's meaningful uh, to you, what kinds of treatments you're seeking. So some of this will be a recap of yesterday, because I see there are many new faces here in the room. And um, uh, so those of you who uh, were here yesterday will uh, hear some of the uh, common themes, and then I'm very happy to have uh, Dr. Christine Duncan here, who is our uh, transplant and gene therapy colleague at Boston, who will be uh, updating us on recent trials as well as uh, cell based therapies occurring uh, in ALD and AMS. Mm -hmm. So, why do we perform clinical trials? And I didn't want to be trivial or mundane, but I thought it would be good to set the stage by just talking to, you know, to also a lay audience about why do we go through all this trouble of performing a trial, and I won't go into details about different trial designs, but just to set the stage, clearly we want to provide evidence on what is safe and what is effective. I think a lot of what we do in evidence-based medicine is centered around what kind of data we have, and if our data is not strong, is not uh, performed in a rigorous manner, we just cannot give you guidance on what kinds of treatments you should pursue over time. Trials help us define the treatment window. Uh, and a lot of the trials I'll be presenting or the plans that are coming up, I'll be talking about inclusion and exclusion criteria. So what that actually means is what is actually what is the window within which a patient is eligible to enter a trial? What kinds of symptoms have to be present? in order to qualify to enter a trial in which symptoms should not be present because the disease might be uh, too far advanced. How do we perform clinical trials also to define optimal dosing and optimal delivery parameters, all clearly with safety first in mind, uh, but then also understanding whether there's something about uh, the dosing, whether we do it once a day, several times a day, uh, whether it's a one-time treatment or repeated treatment, and, and how lasting those effects are. We want to understand biomarkers, that's a big part of performing uh, trials, and understanding we need those biomarkers um, are simply diagnostic biomarkers, are they biomarkers that, that may predict disease progression, or, and that would be most desirable, are they biomarkers that respond to treatment, so are these responsive um, biomarkers. And then, uh, obviously, overarching all of this is, um, does, uh, in the trial, do we clearly show a benefit beyond natural history? So, um, what this really entails, all this entails, we need to understand the disease as thoroughly and as well as we can. And I'm going to briefly take you again through some slides that I presented yesterday, just to set the stage. This is a single gene disorder that has several distinct 
neurological manifestation. So single gene called the ABCD1, and this uh, gene ABCD1 encodes the peroxisomal half transporter that sits on the peroxisomal membrane. It needs to partner either with another copy of itself or with another family member, and then it imports these abnormal, very long chain fatty acids into the peroxisome where uh, they get degraded. So despite having a single gene and this diagnostic a hallmark of very long chain fatty acids, neither of those two predict the phenotype that I know Jesse we talked a little bit about still the dilemma of predicting how, uh, how where things will go over time. Um, and maybe in our discussion we should we can uh, veer towards that. But two distinct phenotypes on the one hand AMN, most common phenotype um, of the spinal cord disease, and on the other hand, cerebral ALD, um, an inflammatory disease of the white matter. And I know a lot of patients who come new to this disease get confused about this because there's a term, <coughs> adrenal leukodystrophy, and they say, well, I don't have ALD, I have AMN. We use ALD as the overarching term for everything. Uh, uh, every time you have, you, you just carry a mutation. And then within that, there are these different phenotypes better distinguished through AMN and cerebral ALD. Why is all this important? Uh, because we need to understand uh, what phenotype you have in order to appropriately treat you. So in childhood, the predominant um, phenotype is that of cerebral ALD with highest risk period between 5 and 10. If, uh, if you move past this risk period, then what occurs is adrenal myelinopathy, the spinal cord disease, non-inflammatory nature, but you can have, have and continue to be at risk for cerebral ALD even in adulthood, not as high as in childhood. But I always remind people that they need to do MRIs in order to still monitor for this. Justin? Does this chart indicate that based on our, our uh, data that the cerebral ALD tends to become almost non-existent does, does this indicate that mid-40s, it, it, we rarely, if ever, will see cerebral ALD manifest itself? It, th that, that is true. It gets, it gets less and less common. I have seen patient, patients uh, in their 40s as well with cerebral ALD. So I, you shouldn't you know, be excluding it, but I think it's really important to uh, perform at least an MRI yeah. once or, or a yearly or every other year at least. Uh, to, sure. to monitor for this. But there, at some point, you move out of the risk period, yes. So as I said before, different um, uh, phenotypes with different pathology. Um, on the one hand, demyelination that spreads out throughout the brain white matter usually spares the area right underneath the cortex and has a lot of inflammatory cells along the leading edge. And on the other hand, AMN, the, um, a, a disease of the, of the back of the spinal cord, um, dorsal columns where all your sensory information is transported. So this is why uh, patients with AMN often have balance problems. Um, and, and on the other hand, the cortical spinal tract uh, that ca carries uh, the, the motor information down from the brain. And you can track both of these phenotypes using MR techniques uh, with the inflammatory disease visible on, on MRI after you administer contrast. And we are understanding that there are subtle changes in the brain in AMN, and in particular in the spinal cord, we're able to now um, measure uh, uh, changes at a level that we were never able to do before, which is really helpful for trials. So when we think about this lifetime risk of developing neurologic disease, I mentioned before there are different periods, and within these um, phases of the disease, whether you um, develop cerebral ALD as a child, uh, we know that uh, you are asymptomatic for long period even though you might be developing a lesion in the brain and only after you develop contrast enhancement do then first symptoms arise um, and then in adulthood uh, clearly 
the brain can be normal with AMN, but you remain at risk for developing cerebral ALD. What I always um, point to as a first success, but also current limitation, is that we only have treatment right now for this uh, um, uh, uh, period, which is early cerebral ALD, where both bone marrow transplantation and ex vivo gene therapy have now sh shown to be effective. We need to go beyond this um, phase and start being expanding treatment targets to uh, patients with more advanced disease, AMN, adult cerebral ALD, as well as the uh, pre-symptomatic uh, children in order to treat them better. Um, and I think I'll show you some of the emerging trials today are starting to actually address uh, some of this, expand, this need for expanded treatment across the whole spectrum of this landscape. And I think it's actually a very exciting time to see this happening after decades of, 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 uh, of seeing that we, we weren't really getting trials off the ground. So I will speak briefly to uh, these uh, expanding treatment targets in ALD and AMN. I'll briefly touch upon gene therapy approaches, lipid lowering strategies, introduce some of the uh, trial plans for immune modulation antioxidants, and then speak to assessing symptomatic treatment. So Dr. Christine Duncan will speak more uh, to the ex vivo gene therapy trial. But just to mention here, finally, we are at a stage where technology has allowed us to safely and effectively put the uh, gene um, that's defective back into the critical part of the nervous system. Uh, but in order to do that the right way, we really need to understand the phenotype, understand the pathophysiology, which are the cells that need to be targeted in order to stop progression. For cerebral ALD, that's very different, where there might be inflammatory disease that's driving this with possible systemic infl inflammation, inflammatory cells uh, that need to be corrected. And on the other hand, in AMN, the non-inflammatory disease, there might be other uh, cells within uh, the nervous system, within the spinal cord that need to be directly targeted. So we use uh, different approaches and also different uh, viral vector delivery techniques. And uh, the timing, the modality, and the delivery are all crucial to doing this right. And if you don't get those details right, you will not be able to treat successfully. I think... Um, <clears throat> Many of us who are in the field of ALD uh, owe a great debt to Hugo Moser, who was really the pioneer in the field, who together with Anne Moser, who's uh, uh, he here with us, um, developed the plasma assay for very long chain fatty acids, went on to now really uh, bring about newborn screening, which is uh, changing the field in, in, in the most wonderful way. And, and uh, his uh, other legacy to the field was uh, Lorenzo's oil that uh, was able to lower very long chain fatty acids um, into the normal range. The um, problem was we did not understand the correlation between cerebral disease and uh, lowering of very long chain fatty acids. And to this day, we struggle with the fact that there is no correlation between the levels of very long chain fatty acids and the phenotype or severity of the disease. Nevertheless, lipid-lowering strategies uh, remain a very hot topic and have uh, given rise to new approaches that might be uh, targeting both lipids as well as other important molecular mechanisms. And uh, uh, here, wonderful work by Stefan Kemp on ELOVL1 inhibition. This is the enzyme that synthesizes very long chain fatty acids. Um, and, and this buildup can be prevented by, uh, by targeting this enzyme even before the very long chain fatty acids are made. On the other hand, there might be approaches where you say, okay, uh, ABCD1 is defective. Are there genes that resemble this uh, ABCD1 closely and could compensate for its function? And uh, the closest um, um, homology is ABCD2, and if you upregulate ABCD2, there are ways to compensate for ABCD1 and lower very long chain fatty acids. And several people have contributed uh, to this thinking. Johannes Berger, Thomas Scanlon has come out with uh, new work uh, around a thyromimetic uh, subutyrome. And yesterday we heard from uh, Catherine Norris on 
on, uh, on plans of the company Neurovia to advance these uh, trials forward. Novel strategies to combat inflammation, oxidative stress. Um, I, I want to highlight here Sujata Kanan, who's worked on patch, packaging uh, N-acetylcysteine into uh, dendromers. These are little uh, nanoparticles that can carry effectively uh, um, uh, antioxidants and other uh, drugs into the nervous system and allow for a longer half-life of, of, of um, some of these drugs. They can target through this neuroinflammation. Many of these uh, dendromers are taken up into inflammatory cells such as microglia and macrophages and, um, and, and in those cells then release uh, their payload. And so this has given, up, given rise to a new generation of thinking of, of antioxidant treatments. And uh, company Orpheris is now uh, taking some of this uh, approach forward and now taking this conjugated N-acetylcysteine uh, into uh, uh, this, this dendromer conjugated to N-acetylcysteine into trials and really targeting microglial cells that we know play such an important role in inflammation of a cerebral ALD and uh, this uh, selective delivery of N-acetylcysteine to activated microglia uh, should be able to stop the inflammation and stabilize neurologic function. So yesterday we heard from a Ferris um, that they have conducted a phase one study of safety pharmacokinetics and now they're planning a first phase one, two, three trial of this drug called um, OP101 in subjects with advanced cerebral ALD. And I, and I want to pause here for a moment because I think this is such a landmark that we've finally gotten a company to tackle advanced cerebral ALD. So for the first time, we're stepping out of that window that everybody is going after, which is early cerebral ALD, to say, well, maybe there is a chance and, a, and an opportunity to take on a different part of this disease that so far we thought was not amenable to treatment. And clearly it's all about the details of the biology and the timing and the delivery and the target cell. So they're going to do a phase one, two dose escalation open label study of, of uh, delivering this intravenously and then going to conduct a phase three randomized placebo controlled uh, trial um, and have already had interactions with the FDA. So what do these inclusion and exclusion criteria look like? I mentioned before, you need those in order to define um, the population you want to treat. These will be boys between the ages of two and 10 years of age. They have to have adrenal leukodystrophy is documented by very long chain fatty acids and an MRI lesion that is more advanced than would be acceptable for conventional bone marrow transplantation. So these are boys who are not eligible for BMT. And I can say again and again, despite now being in the era, uh, era of newborn screening, I get contacted from, by families that have children that are too advanced for, for safe bone marrow transplantation. So I think this is a really important step forward that we are actually now uh, able to have a trial um, where, where boys could enroll and, and um, um, we could see an, an impact of new treatment. Um, excluded are boys who have gone through bone marrow transplant before and clearly you have to come off any other concomitant uh, treatments uh, such as uh, Lorenzo's oil or, or other dietary regimens and your adrenal insufficiency needs to be treated. I think why it would be possible to conduct a trial like this even in advanced cerebral ALD is because we have a good MR imaging biomarker and particularly the evidence for neuroinflammation uh, through contrast enhancement uh, is, is something that's clearly visible, that's something you can um, uh, uh, see on, on imaging and, and know very quickly whether you are effective in, in changing that inflammation, that contrast enhancement. So this phase one, two will allow its safety dose and ability to decrease gadolinium enhancement um, com and com compare them to outcomes seen after conventional bone marrow transplantation. 
So um, another reason I think this, uh, this uh, trial makes sense and this, and this enterprise um, uh, fits a good biological as well as uh, uh, an unmet need in patients is that we've seen N-acetylcysteine uh, uh, show effect in advanced cerebral ALD when it is used in the context of a bone marrow transplantation where um, boys that had less scores above 10 had improved survival after BMT when treated with N-acetylcysteine before and after the procedure. And this was work out of the University of Minnesota that, uh, that started these uh, first attempts. Um, it was very hard for them uh, you know, to prove the independent effect of N-acetylcysteine um, when, when, when doing these kinds of studies because they didn't have control arms and so on and so forth. But um, it, it's a nice um, rationale and, and ju justification for moving forward now with this dendromer uh, N-acetylcysteine uh, approach. Moving on to uh, uh, other strategies to combat oxidative stress, uh, here I want to mention Aurora Pujol, who's uh, for uh, many years uh, spent time trying to understand uh, oxidative stress uh, in um, AMN and ALD. Oxidative stress uh, is really a, an umbrella term for many different phenomena that happen within the cell after um, uh, very long chain fatty acids accumulate. It may be that very long chain fatty acids are the primary culprit uh, for oxidative stress. There may be other mechanisms within the cell uh, through which oxidative stress arises. Um, but importantly, she was able to find that there were compounds that were already on the market for other indications that were able to um, combat oxidative stress and were efficacious in mouse models of ALD and AMN, pioglitazone being one of them, halting axonal degeneration in the mouse model of, of ALD. Uh, I think one of the nicest contributions of uh, Aurora's is that, that she was able to show that oxidative stress was the uh, earliest marker in the mouse model of ALD arising around three and a half months of age in the spinal cord. You can see um, markers of oxidative stress and uh, by targeting those early and in both the um, ALD mouse as well as double knockout mouse where both ABCD1 and ABCD2 are knocked out. So this has now given rise to different um, 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 companies taking uh, this approach forward um, and, uh, and building on uh, the knowledge of pioglitazone. Pioglitazone uh, is a compound used for uh, uh, in type 2 diabetes and uh, this uh, the company Deuterex presented yesterday their approach that is um, looking at um, uh, enantiomers which are uh, basically the two mirror images of the same compound and I put here an image of this um, of the two mirror images of, of chemical compounds as they often exist in, in, in mixed uh, in mixtures within uh, a drug and they've been able to study this more closely and understand that there, there may be uh, different um, um, uh, uh, effects uh, depending on which one of these uh, uh, chiral compounds you choose. F um, both of them have uh, are, are chemically uh, pioglitazone, but one of them has has is a, st a stronger PPAR um, gamma agonist, whereas the other one is not. And the other one shows more anti-inflammatory and lipid lowering ability, um, and is the one that they're taking forward. So, what is the developmental status of this uh, drug of Deuterex? Uh, they've gone through safety toxicology, 28-day uh, um, dog safety toxicity. Uh, they didn't see any toxicity at three times the equivalent dose uh, uh, being used in, uh, in humans. And they had a pre-IND meeting and have conducted a phase 1A, that is a, a toxicity studies uh, um, uh, conducted in, in normal volunteers and uh, they did not find any adverse effects and are, are now uh, poised to move forward to uh, trials in AMN. Another company uh, that is uh, taking 
uh, uh, this work of Aurora Pujols Ford uh, is uh, the company Minerix that is um, working with a pioglitazone metabolite called Min102. And uh, Min102 is uh, similarly aiming to uh, counteract mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, neuroinflammation, demyelination, and uh, axonal degeneration. Uh, they plan to conduct a treatment trial over two years um, that will be uh, placebo controlled um, with the opportunity to enter into an extension phase with MIN-102 after two years. That means you go into the trial, you're ran randomized either to drug treatment or to placebo, but with the knowledge that after two years you will get access to uh, the compound itself. And who will be eligible for this uh, kind of trial? Um, it will be men between the ages of 18 and 65 years. So this uh, study is clearly targeting um, adrenomyelinopathy. You have to be able to uh, stand and walk uh, um, to participate in these investigations. You uh, uh, must have no contraindications for MRI. Um, you, are, you shouldn't have any signs of cerebral inflammation on MRI. That means you shouldn't have contrast uh, enhancement as I showed you on the images before. Clearly you shouldn't have had bone marrow transplant or be on other concomitant um, medications that might be altering your uh, disease course ahead of time. So I think this is also very exciting. Another first in the disease uh, beyond the first Lorenzo's oil a study that was conducted at Kenny Krieger and was uh, prematurely interrupted. This is uh, going to be uh, a, a trial for AMN that we hope will also lead the way from many other treatments that will come about. So they've started enrollment in Europe and they will plan to uh, start enrolling in the US uh, in 2018 and are currently um, um, uh, contacting various sites and um, we heard yesterday from Minerix and uh, that we, we will be um, kept up to date on all the plans, so await more on our website. So I hope I've shown you that we've expanded treatment targets in ALD and AMN. We're seeing first uh, trials for advanced cerebral ALD, very exciting trials for AMN in the planning um, and coming uh, to us in 2018. I hope that um, we will also get to trials with adult cerebral ALD and understand whether there is a, a, a better way to uh, address the pre-symptomatic patients over time as well. Um, I think there are challenges for industry to, and we, uh, that to engage in rare neurological diseases. Often there are too few patients to power studies. There's often a poor understanding of natural history that impairs trial design. We they need uh, support from FDA and regulatory authorities. And more importantly, most importantly, they need patient engagement. They need to hear from you what is meaningful um, and, and, and what is a meaningful change that a drug could bring. Uh, they, they cannot target something uh, that doesn't carry any meaning to you. It wouldn't change your quality of life. In order to address this, we started an industry advisory council in ALD Connect where we bring together biotech that is interested in advancing uh, treatments for ALD and AMN. We meet uh, every other uh, month in Boston and, and uh, have a round table. We usually uh, start with a patient uh, presenting their own story. And I can tell you there's nothing that um, uh, resonates more with uh, uh, drug developers than to hear the plight of a patient. So really, if, if you have a chance here to talk to uh, companies, uh, do that because they, they really want to hear um, what's important to you. We usually then go on to talk about different topics, whether it's biomarkers, uh, whether it's um, uh, understanding the pathophysiology, whether it's new outcome measures. So this has been really wonderful. And the mission of the uh, Industry Advisory Council is to bring together strengths, identify gaps, make use of synergies and complementary perspectives um, across academia, patient advocacy, and industry. Industry knows what it takes to bring a drug to market as well as uh, knows about regulatory hurdles. ALD Connect uh, has physicians who know the disease as patients who know what is important and clinically meaningful. Together we can define a pre-competitive space where joint work is possible. And I think you're seeing these kinds of emerging trials as evidence of, of this working. 
I want to emphasize that beyond experimental therapeutics, we need to look at symptomatic treatment that is already in place. We shouldn't be ignoring the fact that, uh, that there are treatments that are accessible to patients today. What brings symptom relief currently? How effective and how safe is it? What do patients themselves report? And I'm just going to briefly highlight the fact that there are urinary and bowel symptoms and AMN that for many decades have been neglected and not really been uh, targeted from an academic or research perspective or even from a therapeutic uh, perspective. And we did a first retrospective uh, medical record review in 67 adults with a, a ABCD1 mutations and found that really urinary symptoms were present in 64% of men and 68% of women and bowel symptoms in 44% of men and 64% of women. So a really high percentage. And often these are the symptoms that are not volunteered, not sp spoken about, and are kept, uh, you know, uh, also not visible from the outside. I, see, I uh, had a, a, a wonderful young man tell me, he came in with his cane, and he said, Dr. Eichel, you know, people see my cane, people see it, my wheelchair, they do not see that I, suffer from bowel and bladder problems. And this is what keeps me indoors. This is what keeps me afraid from actually leaving the house. So I think it's important that uh, this is, to understand this is not just a medication issue. This is also uh, understanding management and strategies. What are the dietary a a a t uh, aspects that contribute to this problem? Uh, should one restrict caffeine, alcohol intake? Doing pelvic floor exercises yesterday, uh, uh, an AMN patient volunteered how important uh, that was uh, to her, and many other things that uh, uh, patients have found helpful. And through our database and through our clinical records, we are able to bring some of this information to the fore and, and are collating this currently. But clearly there are a, a, a wealth of different drugs out there that have varying effects at different stages of the disease and with different duration of effect. And I think every patient will say, well, this worked, but only for a certain amount of time. Well, we need to define this better. We need to give this a little more definition um, in order to understand how we can help patients move forward. And lastly, and importantly, we're acting here on FDA feedback and developing patient survey methodology. Um, this is uh, work spearheaded by Rachel Saltzman and Jacob Keen, and I hope that many of you will participate in this. This is a first study where we're doing qualitative interviews in AMN patients to find out what is important and meaningful to them and do the topics that they identify actually match the topics that are assessed in our quantitative performance measures. We assess walking, we assess mobility, but is that really what's most important to patients? And if there are new items, can we create new quantitative uh, measures that will capture those? So I will stop here and, um, and turn over uh, to Christy D Duncan. Thank you. Thanks. If there are questions, we'll take one quick question and then we'll move on because we'll have a discussion after. Please. What you've been saying, what I've just been hearing is exactly what's going, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's exactly what's happening with me. And uh, I went through a stem cell transplant and I'm doing better on that end. I'm doing fantastic, actually. But of course, my legs are still getting weaker. My uh, bowel and bladder, I still have problems with. But I would love to share all that I all that I can, if I had time to, or if anyone else wanted to see me about that, I would love to share what I could about how to control my bladder and my bowels, if that could be helpful. Uh, th uh, absolutely. This is what this meeting is about. So, so there, there will be later sessions where we will have also um, uh, um, breakouts and we'll have time to network and uh, let us talk and I'll also connect you to uh, some other patients where we can oh. uh, do this together. Okay. So, yeah, also I just wanted to say, uh, someone's asking me to say something about N-acetylcysteine, that I am still on it, that I have uh, played around with uh, lowering or raising my dose. Of course, it is an over-the-counter medication, and yet uh, it seems to be having some, uh, uh, it could be what's having some good effects on me, actually. So, yeah.